Good evening, everyone. Thanks for being here. For those of you joining a WIT series for the first time, welcome. My name is Lynn Bolger, and I am the executive director of the Authors Guild Foundation. WIT is our words, ideas, and thinker series where we explore interesting and important issues of the day. We like these to be conversational, and so we leave a lot of time at the end for Q&A. Don't be shy. Nikki will call on you during the question and answer period if you raise your either cartoon Zoom hand or your real hand. And if you are really shy, you can put your question in the chat and she will read it for you if you like. Um, our guests tonight are Gia Tolentino and Ronan Farrow. Gia is a council member of the Authors Guild and is a journalist and staff writer at The New Yorker. Before joining The New Yorker, she was the deputy editor at Jezebel and a contributing editor at Hairpin. Her first book, the essay collection Trick Mirror, was an instant New York Times bestseller and named one of the best books of the year by many media outlets, including the New York Times Book Review, The Post, NPR, and the Paris Review. Gia is the Joan Didion of her time writing blistering and funny and searching essays on everything from the music scene to women's reproductive rights to vaping. Ronan is an investigative reporter and produces documentaries for HBO. His stories in The New Yorker expose the first sexual assault allegations against Harvey Weinstein, among others. Ronan has won the Pulitzer Prize for Public Service and for, and of, among other authors, for his investigative reporting. He is the author of War on Peace, The End of Diplomacy and the Decline of American Influence, as well as Catch and Kill, Lies, Spies, and a Conspiracy to Protect Predators. He graduated at 15 from Bard College, was a Rhodes Scholar, went to Yale Law, and I'm just gonna stop there. He's an amazing polymath. <laughs> Welcome, Gia and Ronan, and thanks for being here. Great to be here. Yeah, you, it's really good to be here. Thanks so much. Um, you both, together and separately, have been writing about the lives of women for years. Individual women like those in the Harvey Weinstein or Andrew Cuomo scandals and Brittany, as well as women's lives in general in, say, the essays of Trick Mirror. Let's start with your recent New Yorker articles on Britney Spears, and then we'll talk about how her story fits into a larger cultural narrative. I must admit that I was a little intellectual snobby when I say I was surprised to see Britney covered in the New Yorker and Smithsonian and Lapham's Quarterly, among other outlets. But I am old. So Gia, talk about the place that Brittany holds in our collective imagination. She was born in 1981 and not 10 years later was on the national scene. Yeah, um, it's, it's funny, we had, I wouldn't say we had to convince the New Yorker to do the story, but I think we did, ha we had to a little bit convince them that it was not sort of a kitschy, you know, that this wasn't gonna be sort of a high camp, um, you know, just like pure cultural analysis. It's, you know, I mean, I, I do think I, you know, as Bron and I are both deeply of the Britney Spears generation, you know, we, our entire adolescence was contained within, you know, what other people's were for the Beatles or Madonna, right? Like it was, she was everything. She was the, the star, the great white hot star around which everything revolved. And, you know, I do think from a purely cultural standpoint, it was very clear to me that, I mean, she occupied such a central place in, like her entire, her entire life, her entire image, her entire body, her entire life trajectory is a result of, of just almost a national projection of what we want women to be and not to be and all, all of the conflicting things they're in. But, you know, I mean, as this is another reason that I, I was so glad that Ronan and I could do this together but because it, it wasn't just that she's this cultural figure. It was also that she is caught in the middle of an extremely, you know, this completely unregulated corner of the legal system that there was like a real investigative story that, 
you know, I mean, now there's been endless stuff on it. The Times is, you know, with the Times documentary and everything that followed, but, um, but we did, I would say we had to do a little convincing. And that's uh, I, how you, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, please. I was gonna say, and is that how you framed it for the New Yorker that too, she represents this, you know, it's this legal piece, but also what she rep represents as a, as a woman in the industry or a woman on that stage, national stage. I think the part of the genesis of this piece was that both Gia and I were independently interested in circling it. And then there was a moment where it went from a conversation just between me and my editor, uh, you know, obviously more in my kind of investigative lane uh, to a wider conversation within the New Yorker uh, where my editor discovered that Gia was already on this. And of course, my immediate response was, I'm a huge Gia Tolentino fan. Like, let's do this. <laughs> let's, let's crack open the Britney thing. Let's free Britney. Um, obviously, <laughs> asterisk, you know, we did not enter into this as activists. We really just wanted to find the facts. But I think it was clear that there was something amiss here and that it was really consequential legally. I think the big stumbling block was not the, the quality you just described that you know, this was a, a significant woman to the culture and she represented all these kind of thematically rich and interesting things. I, I think everyone, including uh, dear David Remnick, uh, appreciated that. But I think a lot of people had the stumbling block you had of like, why is this anything other than a cultural issue? And mm -hmm. first of all, The New Yorker is, and a lot of writers on this call who have contributed to different magazines might find this interesting. You know, it's a small outlet in terms of headcount, and they do not have the philosophy of a daily newspaper when it comes to putting multiple people on stories. So it's always a conversation when I anyway am lobbying to team up with someone, which I find is a position I find myself in a lot because investigative yeah. reporting is really onerous, and it's incredible to team up with someone when you're in this very kind of high stakes adversarial line of work. Um, and in this case, I think, you know, there were conversations where people thought, okay, Gia makes sense, like she'll elevate this, she's the best kind of cultural voice we have, uh, and she'll bring a lot of smart stuff to it. Do we really need an investigative person on it as well? In addition to the principle of why are we doubling up people, uh, you know, why would we assign someone who tends to focus on kind of more legal things, more kind of dry or clinical investigative things, uh, and I said, you know, don't put either of us in a box. Let's do this together. I made a lot of the points that that you know you all have already made that this was of tremendous consequence to a wide population of people, particularly disabled people, who are in yeah. conservatorships, and that it would set an interesting set of legal precedents, and that that all dovetailed with this incredible set of cultural connotations that she has. Well, I think before the Free Britney movement started, no one had really understood what a conservative ship was unless maybe you had an older parent or somebody with a mental um mental health issue or like dementia um can you explain how her conservatorship worked what things were restricted to her i mean i i think gia j jump in when you have a thought for for my part anyway I was shocked at almost every turn in the reporting to find just how much she was restricted from uh, and, and with just how little basis. You know, when I talked to people who were involved in upholding this conservatorship, they would say things like, well, if we let her handle her own finances, she'll go down to a car dealership and just like want to buy a bunch of cars. and. It, and there, there was talk of her, you know, wanting to back out of a tour one time and this being, you know, terribly deleterious to her career and not being able to be in full command of your professional decisions and your finances, uh, having a very kind of constrained relationship with your kids, which is part of the heart of the story that Gia really did an incredible job getting at too. Um, I think you got that, Gia, from the beginning, that this was like part of what made her tick in a really consequential way that people hadn't covered enough. I, I just came away more and more with each new fact that was added, thinking this isn't how we set up our country or legal system. You know, we live in a nation where we allow people to ruin themselves financially if 
that's the place they're in at that point, you know? And uh, it, it isn't really the job of these kinds of structures to prevent that kind of, you know, strategically inadvisable behavior. I thought, totally yeah, that. I mean, I, I found this so, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. I found this part so, um, the more we reported on it, the more this became interesting to me on the level of the sort of like Kafka-esque, um, you know, self-predictive bind of the nature of the conservatorship, right? That it's like, once you are deemed incapacitated, mm -hmm. you lose the ability to prove your capacity. And because, you know, it, it, to speak specifically to your question in terms of the freedoms that were, I mean, she couldn't drive her own car. She couldn't drive with, she could not associate, who is this dog running? <laughs> pundit is very into- Hi, like, Pundit. pundit. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> he, she, she couldn't, she, she, she didn't have an unmonitored cell phone, you know, and this is a woman who was making, I mean, one of the things that was so interesting from the beginning is if this could happen to the most, one of the most famous and successful and ostensibly powerful people in America, right? How, you know, you can only imagine what, you know, how this can take hold for anybody's mother or grandmother or, you know, just like any, like some, someone's disabled sister right like but there was a way in which it was because she was seen as so valuable that her life that this structure was erected around her to protect her protect her from doing anything that would ever endanger that her ability to produce millions and millions and millions of dollars for other people and, which and she could all, do but she couldn't yeah, have a phone she had she couldn't and, have and, a baby I mean, she, right. Yeah. We, yeah. I mean, that's a detail you guys all probably know. You know, she claims that her, um, her father like wouldn't let her remove her IUD. And this is something we had heard in a reporting, but, you know, couldn't source well enough to put in, but I mean, but it's, it goes to the point she, she essentially, she could not associate with, with the people. She could not make friends. She couldn't keep friends. She couldn't call people. She couldn't go out dancing. She couldn't choose what she wanted to eat. You know, she, she had all the money in the world, but she couldn't, she wasn't allowed to spend it, right? And we, a lot of the disability rights people we talked to, they they talked about the, the dignity of risk, you know, which is something that I don't think I had quite encapsulated for myself that, you know, I mean, it's, you don't learn the, the entirety in a way of what it is to be human is to triangulate your life against your own previous bad decisions, right? I mean, you don't, the, the, the magnitude of, you know, of having, she spent ages, 25 to 39 within this uh, constraints that would have, I mean, I can't imagine having these freedoms taken away from me for a day, you know, like what, like I would instantly fly off the handle and, and she had, and it was, it wasn't, it almost wasn't despite the fact that she was so successful, it was because of it in a way, mm -hmm. right? It was the protect the asset thing. So I, when I read about it, initially through your reporting and there have been a couple of um, pieces and that I'd like to talk about but I couldn't help but think you know, Ronan said we didn't set up our country that way but in fact we exactly set up our country that way that in the 1770s American coverture basically was a law saying that women could not own property in their own name keep their own earnings have they lost their legal identity hence changing the name um, of a woman to a man's last name, could not make contracts, could not be sued, could not own or even work in businesses. They had no rights to their children. So that if a wife divorced or left her husband, she would not see her children again. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is what she's lived with. Um, by the way, the, it was only in the year she was born, 1981, that the term um, head of household, is that right? No, head and master, um, the high court overturned state laws designating a husband the same year she was born as head and master with unilateral control of property. So, um, you know, obviously we have come a long way, but this, this is a way to go back, right? Um, so to what lengths, Gia, did she go out of go out of her way to get out of this situation? Like what what did she try to do over those years from 25 to 39? 
Well, yeah, this, so this is another, um, you know, an, another thing that I still can't <laughs> have a hard time fully wrapping my head around, even after, you know, thinking about this story for so long, you know, every day, is that she was never able to get legal representation of her own choosing until this past year, you know, at, at which point the, you know, the, the conservatorship was, was broken. I mean, if she, if she had ever had legal representation of her own choosing, this it wouldn't have persisted for this long. But it was because of, you know, she was deemed mentally unfit to hire a lawyer. So it, that was that, right? And and she tried very, very hard to get legal representation. I mean, I was like, I was so, I don't know, impressed is a is a is not the correct word to, but it was, I was moved by by how furiously we this you know according to our reporting right that she was she is you know taking cars out of back entrances of hotels and driving to other hotel rooms where she could meet with a lawyer and get a new phone so she could you know she was getting people to slip her phones in you know burners in you know in random drop-offs so that she could call a lawyer on an unmonitored phone you know she was trying she tried really 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 hard for a long time up to a year afterwards you know she gave one of her friends a note that was like you know, can you read this on national TV that I'm a prisoner? You know, and it's, it sounds so, it's so, it sounds so melodramatic. It sounds so, and I think the, I think that was part of it for so long. It's like, it can't really be like this, you know, like, and, and there was, there was a way in which, um, I, I think there's a way in which the way that our discourse shifted on mental illness when, you know, obviously mm -hmm. at the peak of her quote unquote breakdown, it was like, oh, Britney's crazy and she, you know, deserves whatever, you know, um, like she's, she's crazy. And then over the course of her conservatorship, the discourse changed entirely, you know, in an overdue way. And there was this idea, I think, that it was like, we were so invasive before, so we, just have to, you know, if, if this if this extreme legal situation has locked in around her, surely there must be, you know, an airtight reason for it. And I think that that is central to why, you know, why it persisted for so long. How did the two of you decide what areas of the story you were going to co cover, and how did you how did you do it, Ronan? Like what? What were you responsible for in terms of, you know, getting this story written? And there's a lot of angles to it, um, the financial and the legal. Uh, tell us how you worked on this story. How long did before it came out in the New Yorker, the first one? I'm always interested in talking about this kind of process stuff in groups of writers, because probably a lot of you yeah. guys have been there in terms of decisions like this with, with co-authors. It just fell together very naturally, as far as I ever sensed. Uh, I don't know if you have a thought to the contrary, Gia. You know, the, the extraordinary thing is, yes, as I alluded to before, I'm a little more known for investigative, and Gia is a little more known for cultural commentary and analysis. Uh, but, like, Gia Tolentino is great at everything. So once we got into the investigative side of stuff, like Gia is just as good at that, you know? And, and so really it was a situation where we kind of, I think could move in both of those modes and at both ends of those spectrums. Um, and I think we both contributed to, you know, the reporting and the kind of analytical framework in the end. Uh, but broadly speaking, uh, you know, Gia did a lot of the kind of first draft labor. I did a lot of the kind of knocking on doors, first round of reporting labor. Um, and then we kind of kicked it back and forth, right? Yeah, and we also sort of, we split it in terms of the reporting. I did a lot around her early years, talking to choreographers, collaborators, yes. you know, the <sighs> hair and makeup artists who were the ones that know everything, obviously, right? And and Ronan did, you know, he, he took a crack at the people that, that would not speak to anyone but him, which is a huge category of people. And, and you know, because th there was, that was another aspect of the story, like people have been trying to, her, the circle around her had shrunk to essentially like six people, you know, like there, there were, there were not that many people who had any access to her life after 2008. And so, um, I mean, I, and in that way, I, I felt like I got a really good reporting education um, mm. from from 
just watching how Rodin went through things and also just reading the, you know, because I, I am a little bit, I wouldn't say I'm conflict averse. Obviously you can't be a journalist and, and to be completely conflict averse, but I am, you know, if someone wants to get off the phone with me, I'm like, oh my God, I must respect your desire to get off the phone with me. And mm -hmm. I learned an enormous amount from, from reading the transcripts of Ronan being like, I absolutely understand that like, of course you want to get off the phone with me. I just have, you know, I just have one question about how your day is going. And then they would say something, you know, like it, it's, um, it, yeah, I I was so glad that we got to, um, I mean, if if either one of us had written the story alone, it wouldn't have been as good, for sure. Yeah, it really did. It you know, in response to sort of those early questions of why are we putting two of our you know limited number of people on this uh, that we had to contend with, I think the piece is a really robust answer to that because it it was more than double the quality i feel like at the end like there was kind of a little bit of alchemy between us I, that doesn't always happen with co-authors but i really did feel it it did in this case and um you know she just gave that anecdote about the kind of uh thing that i do all day every day of keeping people on the phone against their wishes <laughs> um but there were a lot of examples where i also i felt like i learned a lot as a writer watching gia there was this great passage that I think earlier on was more towards the like the last third of the piece. It was a penultimate um, kind of discussion where Gia had the idea of using some of her song lyrics, um, which is yeah. it, it requires a, some leaps of logic and analysis because, of course, she didn't write those songs. But Gia pulled such kind of smart, insightful things out of these lyrics, and it became one of the most heartbreaking passages in the piece. And I think it was one of our editors who had the idea of well maybe that's maybe that's the kicker to the piece maybe the end of it is juxtaposing some of those lyrics that we all know her for with uh you know i pulled a quote from one of those court transcripts where she was just starting to speak as we were putting the story out and um so it is it's like it's almost like it wound up being a piece with a with a ronin beginning and a gia end and uh i was very very happy with with how those things work together I also will say one of the things that I was, as Ronan said earlier, I, I think that something that was never central enough and still might not be like cemented as central to the conservatorship story. Like I had had a baby, you know, a couple of months before we started reporting. So, I mean, obviously the, the that, that experience was on my mind and I, I tried not to project it onto her, but the more and more we reported around what actually caused her breakdown, you know, what it was, was that she, she you know, she had been followed around everywhere by, you know, 40 paparazzi, you know, paparazzi jumping out of their cars and taking pictures of her, you know, everywhere since she was like 18, right? And she, all she wanted to do was settle down and get married yeah. and have some kids. And, and she did. And, and she was still going out to clubs because she was, you know, a, a millionaire in 24 and, you know, the hottest thing in Hollywood. And because of that, she got, you know, her, and so was her husband, but nobody was following her husband around. And, you know, he went to Vegas a week after she gave birth to the second kid, a, a year after she had the first one, she um, asked for a divorce. He asked for full custody. And, you know, because so much attention had been on her, I mean, we all remember the extent of sort of just deeply invasive speculation about her morals and her body and, you know, what, if she's a bad mother and she's messy, all this stuff. And her kids, you know, who everyone we spoke to that was like, this is what she's always cared about much more than music, much more than anything. And her kids were removed from her and that, you know, the, 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 the shaving the head breakdown that was d directly precipitated by her driving to her ex-husband's house asking to see the you know her toddler and the infant she was still nursing paparazzi were following her and she got turned away you know she got turned away from her nursing infant and it's like you know i mean i think it was because i could so deeply i had a deep hormonal understanding of what that would feel like but it, it can't be understated the extent to which you know the the, the standoff when the when the helicopters came and she was rushed to the hospital, right? It's it's like she got by the end of this period because the more the less she could see her kids, the more she spun out. The more she spun out, the less she could see her kids. By the end of the breakdown, she could only see them twice a week for four hours with a court-ordered monitor watching her in 
you know, sitting there in the room. And at the end of one of those visitation periods, she was like, I want to keep my baby for another night. And they said, no. And she said, like, I'm, and she locked herself in the bathroom, you know? And, you know, it's like, obviously that's not a rational decision, but it's, the, you know, the, the extent to which that was the center of the whole story. I felt so, so strongly about that. And I, um, and I was, you know, I was deep on the, like, we, we have to foreground, we have to foreground this to the extent that we can, and it makes sense because it still seems to me that that's the story in a lot of ways for her. That launched this, what people consider, you know, her most neurotic or hysterical, and I use those words um, with real, um, uh, you know, so forethought because, you know, in, in, in a Smithsonian piece about her breakdown, it's, um, you know, uh, 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 the writer Louise Godblood says, um, you know, throughout history, women have been locked up and rights taken away because they were hysterical or emotional or, and um, I, I don't think any mother, and my guess is many, any parents um, could, do, could sit through that and not go mad. Um, so, um, so, so that resonated so much with me that, that, those two were linked though so the shaving of the head and um just and the, when she's in the car with the baby on her lap that she was running from the paparazzi and the umbrella situation but I I also do want to point out um can either of you think now I can't help but remember uh, Kamala Harris asking now Justice Brett Kavanaugh can you are there any do you know of any law that regulated the bodies of men? I mean, there are plenty of men in the entertainment business who have had public explosions, drugs, and all sorts of dysregulated behavior, shall we say. Um, you know, uh, Johnny Depp and Tiger Woods and Robert Downey Jr. more than once. But has there ever been um, a time where they have been, a man has been stripped of their autonomy in this way? I mean, there, there, are, there are a few are, cases. Yeah, there are cases of uh, abuse involving. But they're that. mostly, but they're mostly about people who are older. You know, yes. Brian Wilson. Uh -huh. There, there was a sort of, and and there are a couple more, but yep. nobody, nobody this young. I mean, Brittany. There are other. There are also other young women like Amanda Bynes. You know, there. Are people, Courtney Love was, you know, reportedly attempted to put. You know, there was talk about. There's. It's. It's absolutely true that you know, if a man gets rich and wants to blow his money on buying, you know, yachts and, and fancy cars, it's like, yes, he's doing what, what God intended, you know, but if, if Brittany was doing it, it was like, no, 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 you know, you're a mother a now. Of, there's a couple of different forms of discrimination baked into the, the Brittany story. You know, she, the, the fact that she's a woman informs every aspect of the contours of the legal situation, the way she was covered. Uh, you know, the fact that she is a person with whatever her mental health profile may be, uh, I think provided a window that I found really important into the ways in which people who don't behave like everyone expects them to behave can be vulnerable to this kind of abuse. You know, I, I, I think I had the thought a number of times over the course of the reporting Oh, well, you know, this is a juncture where, in addition to all these sincere and earnest and, and quite sophisticated attempts she made to get out, like, I would have pushed it farther and I would have succeeded in getting out, you know, and who knows, right? Um, because on top of everything else, when you deprive someone of so many basic rights for so long, I think they do become less capable of breaking out. Um, but but also she she is a person who, you know, genuinely was exhibiting behavioral patterns uh, that made people trust her less as an authoritative voice on her own condition. And she was a person who didn't know how to navigate all the systems around her that were conspiring to keep her locked up. And I, I think that that 
element of the story is one that actually you see echo in a whole lot of conservatorship abuse cases. And what happens, what is her life like now, do you think? And what happens now for her? Oh, we were talking about this a couple of weeks ago. Um, um, you know, so if, like, I think, you know, I, I don't want to make a flip analogy with, with like actual incarceration, you know, but, but I think her, her situation, I mean, she, as Ronan was sort of saying earlier, so she became famous so young that she, at, at first it, it did it, it did not make sense for her to, to exercise, you know, active decision-making over her contracts, right? She's 13 doing Mickey Mouse Club, right? Like it doesn't, but, but she became famous straight from that so fast that, you know, she never, she never, she never gained the ability to access the pract like practicing decision making, yeah. you know, but even before the conservatorship. And now, you know, it's it's been 13 years of not having an unmonitored phone or being able to drive her own car, right? And so it, right now, she, you know, there are not, you know, things have things have changed to some extent. She can post whatever she wants on social media, and she certainly is. But she, you know, I I, I her situation is is not not analogous to somebody who finds themselves released from some sort of incarceration and doesn't have the you know doesn't understand what these new metro cards are and doesn't you know doesn't understand how to function in a world that they've been removed from for the for you know reasons that they know were wrong <laughs> and and i think she is stabbing towards independence, but you know, I, it, at no point in her life has she ever had access to the concept or the practice. And so it's, it, you know, from what we know and what we hear and what we can see, it's, um, you know, it's, it's tough. Her life is equally, can, her life is still, she's, she also speaks about this openly or, you know, writes about it on Instagram. She's afraid, you know, because she knows, and this is something that disabled people we spoke to talked about a lot. It's like, you know, when you're seen as having a disability, every mistake you make is proof that you're not um, worthy of running your own life. Right. Whereas with people without disabilities, you make mistakes and it's like, oh yeah, you make mistakes and then you right. learn. Right. But she has, she writes, but she's afraid of, you know, she, she runs a red light. It's going to be captured on, you know, by paparazzi, if, if she does, if she puts one foot out of line in a meaningful way, people will say, well, that's why you should never have gotten out of this. And um, she's not wrong. You know, there, there is that uh, set of people lying in wait, waiting for her to make a mistake. You already see in the discourse around the posts that are now more authentically her own and seem to be in her voice. And you know the fact that they are not the most crisply organized and PR ready. Uh, you know people are pouncing on that, and I think that goes back to the point about mental health. I hope this is part of a broader conversation, taking the framework away from just a dichotomy between you know crazy, as the term used to go, and not crazy, and and into a more complicated discussion of you know everyone has their set of mental health issues. And yes, there are some very extreme types of mental health conditions and profiles that require restrictive legal arrangements to protect someone. But that is a that is a small population. And in those cases, the systems are designed to proceed with great caution to make sure they're not overstepping. And you know, I, I think this is clearly a case where it was being uh, maintained, the conservatorship because a lot of its defenders were relying on that kind of old school framing of like, well, look at this post, she's crazy. Right. So I, I hope that, you know, you still see it out there in the reaction to her. I think she'll continue to navigate that, but I, I hope that at the end of it all, people can have kind of a more compassionate and nuanced outlook on, on her and on so many other people who have struggled with these kinds of restraints. But let's move on to other works of your both that focus on women, power, autonomy. Ronan, Catch and Kill, <laughs> the Weinstein and Como sexual harassment scandals, the Me Too movement, movement as a writ large, also focus on women's power and autonomy being undermined. So what do you see as you write about 
these scandals, sexual harassment scandals, and 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 this. Can you talk about that? What do I see? I mean, I, I think that they're very different types of stories. And for me, uh, you know, I'm in the unusual position of being something of a generalist. Gia is too. Uh, you know, there's a lot of people in the reporting and writing business who write for periodicals, certainly, who they have a lane. And, you know, we need those people. Sometimes you need specialists who are really deep in one area. And, and you know, it, I've become deeply sourced in certain topics that I return to again and again over the years, but they're, they're eclectic, right? You know, sometimes I'm writing about a, uh, an intelligence agency whistleblower, or sometimes I'm writing about a celebrity. Um, and, you know, I, I think for me, an important lesson of the reporting you just mentioned, and maybe there's something that ties this to the Britney story too, is I didn't think any of these, uh, topics should be sort of siloed off as women's topics, or in the case of the reporting on sexual violence, sort of, you know, uh, rape reporting that's subject to, you know, a different set of rules and a different set of expectations about what's polite and what's proper and what you can put in a population, a publication. I, I think actually, you know, it's part of the problem amongst the many problems that surround uh, these stories of sexual violence that the subject is so stigmatized, it just wasn't spoken about for a long time. And the expectation was that it was a, it was a whole different conversation about how to report that sort of thing. And, um, you know, the particular challenge there was, I think, the different conversation that a certain old guard in the media expected was, uh, you know, that those are he said, she said stories, and it's impossible to shore them up factually. So I, I think the uniting thing across a lot of these stories was taking them out of that sort of separate bucket of this is a specialized, maybe in some cases, a shameful thing, and just putting it out into the sunlight alongside and equal to any other reporting beat. You know, my feeling was always that, uh, you know, my background is in legal training. And you know, I, I came at it with my law degree hat on like this is here are all of the remnants of these uh, cases of sexual harassment and sexual violence that are left behind in a court case here. Here's the base of evidence. Uh, you know, here are the kind of the prompt outcry witnesses you would approach if you were doing a criminal investigation. Here's the kinds of non disclosure agreement contracts you would look at. Uh, and here's how you approach this like you would any other fact finding mission with with yes some sensitivity to the particulars of the type of trauma at hand right as we had to navigate when we were writing a piece about mental health issues. But ultimately, I think respecting it by treating it like any other subject on some level too. one, one of the uh, sort of scary startling things that you said is that um, I don't think most people are aware of the exotic and extreme tools at the disposable of powerful and wealthy men in America when they are bent at silent accusations against them. Um, so you may have been digging out of the light of day, but talk about the lengths at, with, at which we're um, gone to to sort of silence that. Yeah, it, it's interesting to me, looking back at some of the tactics you're referring to that I've been in the crosshairs of, you know, PIs digging through my trash and staking out my apartment and chasing me around, and, you know, like hijacking the geolocation data of my phone. Just contemplating what the cost benefit analysis was for people paying for that kind of activity. And I think, I mean, what one explanation is, you know, the, the people who go that far are perhaps uh, not engaging in the most crisp and organized decision making <laughs> at the time when they pull the trigger on those kinds of vast enterprises for, you know, seven figures. Um, but, but I also think there's something wider at play, which is those are tactics that could live in the shadows for a long time, and they were really standard. And you know, there, there's still a, a more standardized role for things like private investigation in legal cases. You know, there's 
sort of fact finding that's less over the line. But the the kinds of uh, espionage that I've documented, uh, you know, things like around the Weinstein story, him hiring a firm of former Mossad agents who sent out a sort of femme fatale actress type to like become a source's best friend. I mean, re really like crazy gaslighting stuff. You know, I hope that there's now more of a cost associated with the exposure of that kind of you know, really cruel manipulation of people. Um, and that it's, you know, less viewed as just something that's an acceptable, you know, tool in the battle of facing these kinds of allegations. Cause that, that was the big surprise that I came away with just sort of how, how common these tools are. I actually, I remember when I was first, it was a crazy thing to, to both be in the crosshairs of some of those tactics and then be able to document them. Right. I, I was able to like, to find the guy who was sitting outside of my apartment and get him to go on the record and find the contracts that the lawyers had signed. <laughs> Which you, know, you don't always get to do as a reporter, so I'm I'm really thankful that's the way it all shook out. But I remember when I had broken one of these stories where I had presented all these contracts and documented this, uh, being on with a really prominent uh, news anchor who afterwards on the margins of the show was like, wow, that's so crazy. I was dealing with this personal thing and people were telling me to hire this firm, <laughs> this, you know, this wow. same like firm of <laughs> these Israeli guys. Um, and I was like, yeah, I don't, I don't think that would be the right move. <laughs> a lot of risk of that backfiring, but it does, it kind of gives you a sense of for a certain echelon of a person with a certain echelon of resources, I, I think for a long time, that was just part of the conversation. Like, do we, do we hire a bunch of people to play fake characters and insinuate themselves into everyone's life around this? Wow. I, uh, hopeful, uh, little vignette Gia and trick mirror. Um, you said that the Harvey Weinstein story and everything that followed was possible in no small part because women were finally able to count on a baseline of feminist narrative interpretation. T tell us what you mean by that. So I'm, I'm always very, very conscious, um, you know, that if I had entered journalism in an era earlier than I did, I would not be working at the New Yorker at this age right now. I would not have been hired when I was. I wouldn't have, um, it, it's been really clear to me. I mean, that, you know, I was born into the, you know, the Title IX, like 90s girls soccer generation, right? Like I, Spice Girls, Britney, you know, I mean, it may have been a warped version of, you know, of, of female cultural prominence and, you know, this like, the kind of technicolor ad friendly girl power stuff, but it was still the milieu that I grew up in. And I grew up when it was pretty normal for, um, you know, I, I didn't have to doubt that I, I mean, I never thought that I would be able to be a writer. That's another thing it, that, that being a writer seemed like an inaccessible profession. I didn't know anybody that worked in a creative field at all growing up. It, it still kind of am amazes me that it's possible to make a living writing what I like. I mean, like that still feels like a pipe dream that could go away at any moment. But I, but I was so aware that the freedoms that I was enjoying, right? The, the freedoms that I enjoyed in relationships as an adolescent, the freedoms that I enjoyed, you know, just being able to walk into a room and pretend that I belonged and sometimes have it be believed. You know, this was very clear to me. This was not available to women 10 years before that, 20 years before that, you know, yeah. it's, it's not, um, and part of why I understood that so clearly is because I, I started, I started working in media at Jezebel, which is a feminist blog, basically. And it, and it, you know, that like these websites didn't exist 10 years before I, 10 years before right. that. And they, you know, as much as I have always um, reflexively flinched against the kind of corporate, fem like the, the kind of feminism that's really easy to set, sell ads against, right? The sort of feminism that's based around individual achievement rather than collective well-being, you know, and the, the kind that's about, you know, girl bosses and female CEOs and whatever, it, it still struck me that the fact that that was so popular, that people, that it was Kind of a dominant paradigm in culture the fact that dove wanted to buy ads on a on a feminist website you know a, a, a place where people were 
I mean, it, it just, it was just very clear to me that I was the beneficiary of, you know, I mean, I mean in every aspect of my life, reproductive choice, whatever, I, I've, I'm a benef I have benefited so greatly from work that previous generations put in. And I, and I think that that's absolutely true, that, that it wasn't the case, it wasn't the case that, I mean, you know, now there's this big, you know, Britney's part of it, but you see like the, the Pam and Tommy show on FX and the Monica Lewinsky show on FX. Like there's this, there's this long, long sort of, I think not always productive, but always interesting. Um, the, this act of trying to reclaim all of the, all of the women that were, that were, you know, that pop culture just tortured for so long. Right. And, um, and it took a really long time to get to a point where, where, I mean, oh, I'm, I'm rambling because this is just like, this is just really um, important to me, but I, so I, Jezebel's technically a women's website, right? And I was an editor there for a couple of years. And by the, and this speaks to what Ronan was saying earlier, the, by the, by the end of my tenure as editor there, the readership was 50, 50 male, female, which I found quite instructive, right? It was like you, you know, all these things that we, that are siloed into specific experience, non-universal experience, they are, you know, these things that are women's issues, they are absolutely everyone's issues, you know, issues of reproductive freedom are everyone's issues, right? Like it's, um, and there was proof in that, in the readership. And, and there was, and that was only possible because of so much change that had been eked out in meeting after meeting and argument after argument and like struggle after struggle that I'm sure many of you guys here you know, worked out yourself in your professional lives in a way that I'm, you know, I'm, I'm grateful for. And it, it wouldn't, it wouldn't have broken the same way if it had been 10 years earlier and people had been like, well, well, but yeah. what if they have mental health issues? You know? yeah. I'm going to open up to, um, to, to questions, Q and A, but I do want to um, say that another member of our council and the foundation board is Letty Cotton Pokerbin, and she's written in the chat. Thank you, Gia. She is a co-founder of Ms. Magazine, so I think she's like. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> I'm dropping off the um, the screen, and Nikki is going to take your questions. Please raise your cartoon hand or your real hand and ask our guests what you want to hear. Thanks, Lynn. All right. Yeah, thank you so much, Lynn. Who had it? Oh, here we go. Ralph, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Yes, I mean, I, gee, I was really very taken by your talking about this idea of, of freedom. And I think about the, that you're for minorities and women, freedom can seem very provisional. Yeah. Yet I think women in which the, the men you've covered, freedom is something they feel that it's a, it's a birthright. How do you kind of deal with those those differing ideas of freedom that, that come up in your work? You know, this 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 I think there is this tension between this provisional sense of freedom that a lot of people, women and minorities have, and this Yeah, no, it's it's the I mean I I I would say that I have complicated and I have struggled with this personally, <laughs> um, but I, I think one of the ways that I was thinking about this through Brittany specifically was, um, you know, so the way the specifically, well, like one thing that was clarified for me in the process of reporting this was that uh, Brittany was asked to under the conservatorship, she was asked to operate by a decision-making standard of what is in her best interest, right? And that is not a decision-making standard that any of us are held to, certainly not legally, and and you know probably not in many ways, right? But and 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 that clarified something about like I think there is a way in which marginalized people are constantly having to think about what will what will allow me to claw myself out of whatever um, preconception or, you know, financial disadvantage or other, you know, or, or lack of access. Like, how can I always act in a way that will move my life forward on the terms of the game, you know? And, and, and that's presented, and I think the, 
I think what, what struck me so much was that the idea that what Brittany was doing was in her best interest, it clarified for me the extent to which um, that best interest was not even her best interest as a person. It was her best interest as like an asset, right? And I think that, um, and that clarified for me what, what, what is presented as freedom to women and minorities and marginalized people. That's, that's what that is. It's, it's the ability to act in someone else's idea of your best interest. Um, and, and it's, yeah, like in a way that is a through line and, you know, that, that's a deeper through line, this, this, this idea, I mean, it, it relates to just like the deep American obsession with, um, you know, with, with wealth and optimization and success, like the, the, this idea, like the way that so many ideals that are held up as sort of like absolute and human and eternal are actually incredibly spiritually corrosive, right? And the ways that those ideas get passed down are, um, I just think working on this story showed me another little convoluted universe of, of that. I don't know how I'm working it out. <laughs> Thanks so much. Uh, Ralph is actually on the Authors Guild Council, and he did a previous wit conversation with us um, that I will post the recording link to in the chat. So you guys can check that out. Um, does any oh, I, I also I also want to say too. I just want to shout out the Authors Guild for 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 being a crucial part in New Yorker writers finally having an option to have health insurance, which didn't exist until this past year. In you know, in huge part, thanks to Mary and company. So there, that's another deep um, thing that I'm grateful for. And that's thanks to all of your support. So thank you too. All right, uh, Cher, you want to unmute? Yes, good evening. So I'm curious about um, movements. So the idea of Me Too. So the arcs, are they something that, that you find that you see expectations as to how something's going to progress or or transform, or is it something that you watch and sort of respond to? Odd question, <laughs> sorry. Do you know, like, do you have these expectations when something comes to your to the forefront and there is something that's to be investigated or or brought out and spoken about? Do you tend to see see it sort of come alive and move forward in a certain manner, or does it surprise you and you sort of respond to the the ways that uh, things unfold? Because of course, um, the population is reacting and responding and that sort of thing. So is it is it human nature and you'll you'll tend to see an arc or does it still surprise you today? I'm happy to jump in on this one. I mean, I, I often have to pick stories partly on the basis, I think, of the questions that you're talking about, which you write are, are sort of uh, they're not neat, uh, easy to organize questions. Uh, part of the complicated matrix of decision making that goes into each of my story selections, usually in a pretty haphazard way, where I'm just kind of feeling out all these factors as I go, is what kind of an, kind of an arc will it have? Uh, and, you know, is this going to be uh, a volatile roller coaster of a story with a ton of ups and downs? Uh, is this going to be something where there's a predictable endpoint in terms of how the exposure of whatever I'm digging into uh, will affect the lives of the people involved? Um, you know, one obvious way in which I care about that is often will policymakers care? Uh, is this going to shape the case law around something? Is this maybe going to shift the culture around something? And not every story does that, but some do. And, and I think sometimes you know that baked into the subject is a, a chance at that and that that's worth fighting for. And, and you want to consider it in both directions, right? The, the arc, to use your word, can sort of wend uh, towards the good or, or not. And I think as much as a lot of people, particularly on the investigative end of the business, 
strive to be at a remove. Uh, I think if we're being honest, we all know that there is an observer effect and you know, there is an extent to which entering into the fray is going to change. So, so I do, I try to think about that uh, and take it in, into consideration. I don't know if that's a satisfying answer at all. That's lovely, thank you. Thank you so much. Does anybody else have something they wanna ask before we move on to other questions? All right, well, with just a few minutes left. I just want to see if there's anything that both of you are working on that you're very excited about and want to kind of promote here while you've got all of our attention. Gia? <laughs> <laughs> I've actually, um, I've been mostly screenwriting lately um, and it's been a good, it's, it's, it's good to, I'm, I'm like most happy when I feel like I don't know what I'm doing and it's nice to, you know, switch lanes and again, have no idea what I'm doing. Um, but I'm working on something, I'm, the, the biggest thing that I'm working on is something that I'm struggling with, but I'm, uh, um, I'm, I've been trying to think through, I'm working on this big, big baggy, like sort of existential essay about how I, I think there's, there's a SUNY professor who wrote this paper a while back on how the, the, the hyper evaluation of, of fetal life, the, the hyper hyper evaluation of sort of unrealized um, life is possibly directly in proportion to the hyper devaluation of, of, of existing life under climate change. Um, you know, that the, 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 the sort of existential importance of protecting life, the sort of existential risk of, of, what, of what we are right now as an earth that is endangered in many ways, right, is manifesting kind of in a structure of emotion way in this particular thing where Rose about to fall. Um, and so I've been I've been deep in a lot of rabbit holes about um, eco theory and the history of humans discovering existential risk and it's great. <laughs> <laughs> I part of part of the consequence of my uh, uh, gig is that I am uh, far less interesting when answering that question because I you can't, can't tell say you can't thing say <laughs> about any of the I believe seven stories that I've I've got in the pipeline, um, which are you know preventing me from walking the dog regularly enough apparently. <laughs> well, thank you both. We're going to wrap up. Um, cannot thank you enough, Ronan. I will. I know um, from your mini driver podcast that your um, favorite, your last meal would be lobster. And I am sitting here in Maine and I'm happy to send you a couple. And Gia. With an incredible that... backdrop. I love the <laughs> copper pan. Uh, thanks. Um, our next up uh, for WIT is on February 28th. We are going to be talking with um, Dr. Janet Dewart Bell and Kendall Thomas in conversation about race rights and redemption. And um, then on March 7th, Gish Jen and Beth Ann Patrick are in conversation uh, along the talk of Gish's new book. Um, and the, they'll be talking about opening China, opening lives. So thank you all for coming. Ronan, Gia, thank you again. This has been a lovely night. I so appreciate your time. Thank you for taking you the time, so everyone. Much. I see so many names that I'm fans of here. I know, um, same. I'm losing my mind. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty cool. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Good night, Bye. everybody.